Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yes. We're talking about a big level question about why the Talmud is written in the way that it's written. Why is it not um, just legal answers to all your legal questions? And we've got some good comments uh, here. Okay. It's a conversation. That's why it's really oral law written down. So it's not a legalistic text in the sense of that it's supposed to be written and you're supposed to refer to it as we do a commonly a document. Like we now have printed tablets, but that's not how it was originally, you know, passed on from generation to generation. The printed press didn't come for hundreds of years later, thousands, a thousand years later, actually. Yeah. Um, we've got some other, we, we've, Pepita says it, it also is about preserving and respecting different opinions. True. The Talmud often right. gives us opinions that, you know, are never followed, right? The Mishnah says you can have chicken Parmesan, that that's totally kosher, but <laughs> I don't know any Jewish community that follows that. That's one rabbi's opinion, not, you know, not the one that's stuck. The, the um, Talmud very much wants to preserve other opinions. The Talmud very much wants to preserve other opinions. Okay. Um, and the Talmud many very people, much wants to preserve other opinions. It does not want to just give uh, the bottom line. That's not what it's interested in. Yeah. Um, I see some people saying it's a discussion. It's flexible. It allows for evolution in the law. If you just write a rigid code, um, then you don't have that possibility. I see. Um, I see Maimonides wrote a code that nobody liked. I'd love to hear more about that. I don't know too much about that. Um, and yes. Okay, great. Uh, one other answer to that, that I have heard from one of my like much older classmates in graduate school, she finished before I started. She made the argument that the Talmud's real purpose is to teach legal minds, to teach the next generation of judges. Um, and so it's teaching legal reasoning. It's not teaching law. It's teaching legal reasoning. Um, I would agree with that. So we're gonna. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pass the mic over, Yardena. We're so glad you managed to make it on, um, and we still have 20 minutes for you to steer us around uh, the next, the last uh, seven days of Dapim. I may go to 20. I may go 25. I apologize about that. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I may, and people will stay I as may, much as they can. Yeah, you could. If you could say, you could say, okay. So let's just get started. We'll start on Daf Lamed Ted on page 39 with the Mishnah here. Uh, that teaches us a basic about Nizirut. So the first previous prakim of Seder uh, Nazir, of Masacha Nazir, really dealt with sort of a continuation of Nadarim, and it makes sense that that's why Nazir appears right after Nadarim, more about the vowing of taking a law of Nizirut. And the vow of Nizirut is sort of like the quintessential Nadar. So it sort of gets its own, you know, the first couple of prakim deal with that. Now we're at the point where we're starting to deal with sort of the nitty gritty of the actual law of a Nazir. What does it mean to actually be a Nazir? What are your requirements? How do you fulfill it? How do you get out of being a Nazir? And those are the things that we're starting to see uh, in these dapim. So this mission starts with Stan Nazirut Shloshim Yom, right? Just a basic, unspecified neder vow of Nazirut is going to last for 30 days. Gileach Osho Gilchu Listim. So they now present a very interesting case, which is somebody shaves himself or is forced to be shaved, right? Bandits came and shaved him against his will. Now, again, was this a common scenario? I doubt it. I think this is more what I like to call a, a boundary pushing scenario, right? They want to show you what the limits are. And the point is to say, come across the way that a person could shave their head in a way that was completely not their fault, right? Somebody comes and in an act of violence, shaves your head against you. So tear slow shimyum, right? It can negate even up to 30 days of that Nizi root. So if they shave your head on 30 days, you need to repeat all 30 days. Nazir Shagilach Bain Zu Bain Bitar O Shasif Safe uh Kol Shahu And then in terms of a Nazir who shaves his head, whether he does it with scissors or razor, or if he pulls out any amount, right? And one of the things that Gamar is going to talk about, even if you just pull a hair out, um, even if you shampoo your hair, right? There's even a machloket. Can you sh- can you wash your hair? Can you comb your hair? All of these things that maybe allow for hair loss, right? You would also be chayev. That would be considered to be cutting your hair. And the gemara here starts with what I think is like it's almost comical. 
Um, I can't totally figure out if they mean this like actually seriously, but they start off with the following question. Right? They they raised a question. Hi, Maza Mila Tachad Rave O Mila Ayo. Does the hair, right, when hair grows, does it grow from the bottom or does it grow from the top? So in other words, what they want to know is, is your hair growing from your root or does your hair grow from the tips? So when you can, this has to do with, right, Lamai Nafkamine, right? Lamai Nafkamine is the classic Gamar question. In other words, we have two possibilities of an answer. And the Nafkamina is, is basically, what's the difference in a halachic application? Okay, why would this actually be important to know? So the answer is, is that it's essential to answer a case of the Nazir, right? So they're taking the case that seems the most sort of far out there of the Mishnah, okay? But a bunch of, you know, bandits shave his, his the Nazir's head, okay? But his head is not entirely shaved. And what did they do? They left part of it. So there's enough hair, there's enough stubble sort of that the hair can bend to its end on its root. So you could take the end of a piece of hair and bend it towards the root of the head. Okay. So now they're going to explain the two sides of this. If you want to say that hair grows from the bottom, then he removed the hair of his nizi root. In other words, if he, we say that it grows from the root, he took his vow, the hair starts to grow from the root, okay? So that hair, okay, the hair which which he vowed, he said that he wouldn't shave, okay? And therefore he has to add some extra time. But if you say, sorry, if that's if it grows from the tip because you cut it. If you say it grows from the top, right, then that hair is still there, okay? And so, in other words, the hair that grew as part of the Nizi root, that is still there. And so that's basically uh, what's still there. Now, the Gemara goes back and forth and has all these examples from lice. How could you figure out which way it actually grows? And it's kind of comical how they actually solve this in the end. And the way they solve this in the end is by the following scenario. Toshma misakrata. Right. So we can. Uh, so first they t- they say, OK, maybe we can learn about it from dye wool. OK, the Rafi Amram Milatachat, because the wool becomes loose underneath. So that would show that hair grows from the bottom. The Tanya. And we learned in a brisa. OK, the two. Kad Savi Savia to Kinuhun Chavaran. Right. But when old men dye their hair, their beards, we see that the beards turn white. So in other words, what this proves us is, is that the hair grows from the root, right? Because we see that when people dye their hair, and I just find from a sociological point of view, it's fascinating what the example is that they give. First of all, that men did used to dye their hair. There is actually a halachic question in modern day halacha if men are allowed to dye their hair. There are some posts can we say that maybe they shouldn't dye their hair, that maybe that's something that women do. Okay, but we see here from this Gemara that it's clearly something that men used to do. Um, and it's also interesting to me that it's not an example brought from women. This seemed to be a beauty custom that was specifically something that men did, or maybe men felt more comfortable to allow their roots to show. And women, if they did dye their hair, they wouldn't allow their roots to show. But this was clearly something they could learn from old men. Old men. And then on the top of the next Alma, the Gemara goes on to say, Right. So since we see that the bird turns white at the roots of the hair, we learn from it that the hair grows from the bottom and the new hair is basically not dyed. And so the Gemara learns from this that this must be how we prove it. So they end up not learning it from any sort of halachic source, but they learn it just from something that they observe. And again, I think from a sociological point of view, it's very interesting to see that the the dying is done by men um and uh that it's uh you know and that that's who we're going to learn from specifically from old men who like to dye their beard so they didn't look exactly white okay another interesting thing we learned this week is that this idea of shaving right so we know one of the things that the nazir needs to do is the nazir actually needs to shave his head either if he becomes tame right? If he becomes impure and needs to undergo a purification process to resume his Nizi root, or at the conclusion of the Nizi root passage, he has to shave his head. And there's actually other areas in halacha where they're shaving. Tanan hatam. So 
So we learn in a Mishnah, and this is a Mishnah in Masechet Negaim, okay, cha- uh, in the 14th chapter of the fourth Mishnah, Shlosha Migalchin. There are three people who, who halachically have to shave their head. And I just found this to be interesting because I think these are not areas of halakha. They're not really practiced today. And so it's interesting to see that this was actually a very, very important area of Jewish law, right? mitzvah, And shaving is actually a mitzvah, okay? Nazir, okay? So the Nazir, right, which we've been talking about, Ur Mitzora, right? So always the English translation, not a great English translation, is a leper, but it was obvious that the type of divinely given skin disease, right? Ulevi, Ulevi, or even the Levium, okay? The Kulan Shilgilhu Shalobitar, Oshishirau Shtesarot, Lo Asuba Lo Klub, right? And all of them, they need to basically, um, they need to shave with a razor. And if they're left with two hairs, they have done nothing. Now, just to go back for a second, to me, what was most interesting about this passage, and I've read the Torah many times, is this whole thing about the Levian. This seems to have been like a detail that I actually seem to have missed, okay? But it's actually in Ba Midbar when the Levian started to become Levian, right? When they started to serve in the temple, one of the things they had to do was they were sprinkled with the water of purification. And they actually had to shave their heads. The other thing that they do that the Gemara tells us we're not going to read this particular passage is they physically were picked up and they actually were like waved around. Okay. Very, very interesting. But what we see what's in common with these three categories is shaving is done as some type of purification, right? The Nazir does it to show the ending of some sort of time period. The Mitzorah does it also as they transition out from being a Mitzorah to no longer being a Mitzorah. And the Levian did it as a way of showing of transitioning from just being, let's say, a, a, an average, a regular Jew to now being a Levi Jew, right? Even though they were, you know, from that tribe, they needed to show them they did that part of that process was through head shaving. What follows, and I'm not going to read it because it's the next, it's many topim, and it goes for about two, two and a half topim afterwards, is a very, very detailed discussion about sort of comparing the three and figuring out how do we know exactly that um, they have to shave with specifically a razor. And really what appears on the rest of this top and the following top is a wonderful example of what we call, uh, you know, Midrash Halacha, right? Which we translate into English as Jewish law exegesis, okay? Which is very typical of what the Talmud does. In other words, the Talmud has a law, and instead of just telling us the bottom line, this, you know, ties in a little bit to what we were discussing earlier, instead of just, you know, saying what the bottom line is, what do they do? They go back to the psukim and they want to look at the psukim itself and say, okay, how did I learn this? How do I know that this is halacha? How do I know this part of major questions that we have about halachic exegesis is? It's sort of a chicken and egg question. Which came first? In other words, was there a misora that this is a particular halacha, right? And then they sort of go back to the psukim and they say, this really was sort of posed as a question, right? And, you know, and they had a particular misora. You learn it from this pasuk, right? That's the Torah Shabbat Al-Pad, that's the or law. And that's how we know the law itself. Like it was part of the Mesoah, part of the tradition and the transmission of the oral law itself. It's probably not a binary answer, right? It's probably some laws, right? That it was transmitted with the source in the Torah itself. There are some laws where maybe they went looking for the source itself later on. But I think what's interesting is, is that there's a lot of machloket over halachic exegesis, right? That very often... You'll have one rabbi say one thing, one rabbi say the other thing. The halacha, right? The the bottom line Jewish law is actually the same, okay? It's totally the same, but how they learn it, what pasuk, what verse they use to learn it is primarily what the Gemara is actually interested in. And I think that shows you sort of this, they really pay attention to the Torah Shebechtah, the written law is very, very important to us, right? Every single word needs to be there for a significant reason and impacts how we understand halacha itself. And so again, just tying this back into some of the things that we were discussing earlier, I think that's one of the proofs about that the purpose of the Gemara is the bottom line halacha. 
if they wanted to, they would need to spend, you know, like here, they're going to spend two and a half pages minimally just going through all the exegesis on how do we know a razor? How do we know you couldn't use a different type of tool? What happens if you do do use a different type of tool, right? They even start to bring in examples of the Kohanim, of the priests that they also could not shave. They bring in all these different halakhic categories just to learn this one law. You'll see later on, on there's like a, a you know major machlokas between the rabbis and Rabbi Eliezer over some of this halakhic exegesis. Um, and so Mishnah is there much more for sort of like bottom line. Like, in other words, this this Mishnah that they quote from Nagaim, it gives you the bottom line. It tells you, here are the three halachic categories. This is what they all have in common. And if they don't shave with a razor, and if they don't, um, if they don't shave with a razor, and if they leave two hairs, it's like they didn't do anything. It's the Gemara that's going to really get into the process of that, okay? How do we know that? Why do we know that? Um, you know, what do we do with the different words as they appear in all the different halachic texts in the written Torah that deal with these things? OK, and so I think it's very interesting, uh, you know, to see that that's this. I think that these pages really give you this interesting contrast between what the Mishnah does. Mishnah being much more like bottom line, easy to memorize halacha, whereas the Gemara is really there to teach us the process and the story behind it. OK. Now we're going to go on to 42, to the bottom of 42A. Just give me a little second. If anybody has any questions, I don't know if there are any questions there in the chat. While well, I'm scrolling ahead here. Okay. Rob Plass okay. says that we should do smicha by shaving and waving rabbis. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the Levim. Okay. So now we get to a Mishnah that really talks about um, sort of what are the actual prohibitions uh, that you have to do. Nazir shayasho teyayin kol hayom. Okay, so let's say you have a Nazir, right, who drank wine the whole day. Okay, so we know that there are three major prohibitions for the Nazir. One is consuming any great products. It's not just wine. It can even be there was a whole discussion. Grape leaves, grape stems, anything that comes from the vine itself. The other one is cutting your hair. And the third one is... Uh, you know, not coming into contact with a dead body, not becoming tame from a dead body. So let's say you have a Nazir who comes, takes a vow, and he says, okay, I'm going to drink wine the whole day. How many chatat, how many sin offerings do they have to bring? They just have to bring one. All right, so you basically could drink all day, have multiple drinks, and you only have to bring one. Amrulo, let's say two witnesses come, and they do this process of what we call hatra. Hatra is a formal process where witnesses come, two witnesses, and they formally warn the person. They say, you are about to drink, and we're warning you that you are going to violate a prohibition that's in the Torah. So they say, al tishta. They say, don't drink, al tishta. In other words, they remind him. They quote the pasuk. They say, you're not supposed to be drinking. Behu shota, and the nazir still drinks. Chayev akol achat v'achat. At that point, he's basically liable, right? For each and every time that he is warned, every time that he was warned, they go and warn him a second time, he has to bring another chata. Let's say he shaves the whole day. He's only chayab one chata. Again, he's warned multiple times. Don't shave, don't shave. And he shaves. Again, he's chayab for each and every one. Now, this is the one that's a little interesting, okay? Let's say he exposes himself to many corpses. Now, again, once you're exposed, you're exposed, but the Gemara is actually going to talk about that there can be, like, multiple exposure. Like, you sort of, like, that tuma can be sort of, like, cumulative, okay? Right? He's only chayav one chatat. But again, if they give him that warning from the Torah, don't become Tameh, don't become Tameh. Then again, he becomes Chaya for each and every time. Okay. And so basically, then the Gemara starts with a dispute of the Amoraim, Itmar, right? This is what was said. Amarabba Barbara Huna, Rabba said that Rav Huna said, Mikra me male diber hakatu. This Torah states the halacha right? Sort of in a mikra male. It's like categorical. Lo yitame, right? He should not become impure. And the rest of us who tells us for his father or his mother, or his brother or sister when they die. In other words, all the people that we normally allowed to become tame for, 
we can become impure for, right? We have to be busy burying their body. For Nazir, he's actually not allowed to do this. And again, this may be one of the reasons why, one of the themes that we see in Nazir, and we saw it in Nazarim also, is that the Nazir is not looked upon as necessarily a great thing to do, right? And this may be one of the things, think about it, you wouldn't be able to give your parent or God forbid, another family member, a spouse or a sibling or a child, their final kavod, their final respect by actually preparing them and getting them ready for the for uh, for burial, right? Because you decided you had to be an azir. You decided you had to be strict with yourself. And I think this gives us one of the examples why maybe we're not so comfortable with an azir. Because shehu omer lo yavo, right? So it also says, right? The pasuk also says lo yavo lahazero al hatuma lahaziro al habia about tuma vituma lo. So then the Torah also says you shouldn't come near a dead body, right? So this is the warning specifically about not getting becoming impure, okay, from any corpse at all, right? And so that basically warns him that he shouldn't be with any type of, of, of corpse at all, okay? But when we talk about becoming, you know, impure, impure again and again, okay, that there's no warning about. So what Rav is saying in the name of Rav Huna is it actually seems you only can become Tame one time. But Rav Yosef Amar, Rav Yosef says, Ha'elokim, this is like emphatic, by God, Amar Rav Huna, Rav Huna actually said, Afilu Tuma Vituma, he said, no, you can sort of be liable for contracting Tuma and Tuma again. Tuma can be cumulative. Nazir Shayao made Bebet HaKvurot. Let's say you have a Nazir who decides to stand in a cemetery, okay? Behoshitu lo meto umet acher benagabo chaya, right? And so let's say he's standing in a cemetery, so he's already tame, and then they extend him his corpse. In other words, they mean the corpse of, of, of a relative of his, Okay, and he t- right to him, or they give him another umitacher or another course, the nagabo, and he touches it. He's chaya. Am I why? Why should it be chaya for touching that second corpse? He already was chaya. He was already tummy just for going into the Beit Hakvurid for going into the cemetery. Ella lavsh mamina amarafuno afilu tuma betuma. Right. So why do we say that is right? So basically, what we're saying is is that he we we learn from Rav Huna that you basically can be, you know, you can acquire Tuma and Tuma over again. You can constantly uh, sort of uh, re-expose yourself to Tuma. And I think, I'm not going to read, the, they, they go through much more of this discussion, but I think this discussion here highlights one of the things that is unique about the Tuma one, right? Because eating wine or any part of grape, right, consuming any grape product or shaving your hair is an action right? That's an action that you do. And it's an action that the Nazir is not allowed to do. Tuma and Tara, right? Ritual purity and impurity is a state, right? It's just, we're saying a person is now impure. A person is, is, is pure. How do you tie a status to an action? And I think that's really what this machlokas is over, right? If you think that it's just a state. So once you You've transitioned over to that state. You're tummy. That's it. You've, you're in that state. You couldn't possibly be chayav. Can't violate that prohibition again because you've already entered into that state. But if we want to say that there's something about the act of acquiring that state, of transitioning over into that state, requires an action. And what's that action? Going into a cemetery, touching a dead body, right? Something like that. That's what the Nazir is not allowed to do. And in that case, if you feel that we can tie an action to that change of status, right, then you would say that you could be chaya, you could you could violate the prohibition multiple times and do tuma on tuma. So I think there's something just a little bit interesting about the tame one, about the tuma one, because it's not a typical action the same way that eating or shaving is, right? We think of tuma and tara as much more of like, it's a yes, no, you're either tame or you're not tame. But here with the nazir again, there seems to be they tie it to some sort of action. I think that's ultimately what this machlokas of the Amurayim uh, is actually about. Okay, we'll just do one more quick little section here. I'm just going to check the comments quickly. Um, okay, someone had to leave early. Thank you. Okay, yes, I know I'm going a little bit over. I apologize about that. Okay, um, we're going to go to 43B. Okay. 
So this also I thought was really, really interesting. The Gemara then gets into a whole discussion about the concept of mate mitzvah. And the idea of mate mitzvah is, is that the obligation or uh, the, the mitzvah of burying a person who does not have anybody else to bury him. And this is considered to be one of the greatest mitzvot that we can do. It's called a chesed shel amet, right? Which literally turns into a loving kindness of truth. But what it means is, is that it's not an act of kindness where the person can be paid back, right? Because the person is dead. So he's never going to be able to pay you back. So you're doing an act of kindness that you know there won't be, at least in this world, any type of return on. I'm a Rav Chista, I'm a Rav. So Rav Chista says in the name of Rav, Miktaro Shoshalavi, very, very graphic Gemara. Let's say, right, his father's head was severed, okay? Um, okay, Eno Mitame, okay? So here we're talking about priests specifically, not about the Nazir, right? A priest, right, we know is only allowed, a Kohen is only allowed to be Tame for seven, for his seven relatives, okay? And that does not include, right, so it's his parents, a spouse, a brother or a sister, but it has to be an unmarried sister. A married sister, a Kohen is actually not allowed, and that's something we still do today, um, or for a child, okay, a son or a daughter. So those are the seven people that he can become Tame for. But let's say his father's head was severed. Eno mitame. He cannot become tame for that. My time. Uh, what's the reason? Amar kra, because the pasuk says le aviv, and we say bizman shehu shalem, and that means the body, because it says for his father, means it has to be a fully intact body. Vulo bizman shehu chaser, and not when the body is not complete. Amar le Rav Hamnuna. So Rav Hamnuna says, Eleme ata kaziel pakta de aravot. So again, we're going to be with some robbers or bandits, right? So Rav Hamnuna says to Rav Chisa, okay, what about a case where let's say Cohen, two Cohen's, a father, son Cohen are walking together and they're in this place called the Valley, the Pakta Aravo. So it's basically, they were in an unsafe place. It was a place that was frequented by bandits, okay? And they killed the father. Are you going to say that the son shouldn't go ahead and bury him, right? Like, of course the son should go ahead and bury him, but he's just going to leave his father's body there without the head and leave the head there. That's like even more disrespectful. Of course he should go ahead and he should bury him. Amar Lay, so Rav Chisa says back to him, mate mitzvah kamar, right? Don't, are you speaking of a, a of a body where there's nobody to bury it? Hashayesh lamar, right? Of course that's not this halacha that I'm talking about. When I say that you can't bury the father, it can't be that, right? Right, so if others can bury a mate mitzvah, of course he can bury the mate mitzvah. So of course that's not a good case, right? Of course he can bury that father. The high mate mitzvah. So then the Gemara asks a very interesting question: Is it a mate mitzvah? The hot tanya, right? Didn't we learn in a brisa? Ezohi mate mitzvah. What's a mate mitzvah? Kol she'en lo kovrin. It's when somebody doesn't have anybody to bury him. That is a mate mitzvah. And that's the classic definition that we see. There's a, someone who dies. And I think today the modern version of this is, and we've actually have solved this how, like communally, right? That sometimes you'll hear, you know, you, on, on social media, somebody will write like, there's an elderly Holocaust survivor who died in my community. They have no relatives. We're looking for a minion to come to the cemetery, right? Or there's someone who died with no, you know, also no family, we're looking for somebody to come to the cemetery. And people put these things out like on Facebook. I'm not an Instagram, I've only been on Facebook. And then you'll hear that like a hundred people showed up. That's a modern day example of a mate mitzvah, right? Um, that's what the Hebrew Free uh, Burial Association does, right? Like in many communities, there's an organization that for poor Jews who unfortunately do not have a way to actually, they can't afford to be buried. There's a community organization that will actually bury them and cover the costs of their burial, okay? But this concept of taking care of our dead, of this mate mitzvah, we can already see in the Gemara. And so I thought this was very interesting to see that this is, a, a, it, it's really a very long held custom in Judaism, right? That we really need to make sure that the bodies are taken care of. Koreva cherem onimoto. So now we talk about, okay, let's say there's a place, okay? where others can go and bury Ainzo mate mitzvah. Now, some people explain that this could pertain to the Kohen. Let's say the Kohen can push it off and have someone else bury, right? Maybe then the Kohen doesn't have to do it. That's not a mate mitzvah. Baha'i slave bere. 
uh, right? But in this case, right, with the dead father, with the son, right? Right? They were walking together and basically he's considered like there's no one else to bury him. And so in this case, it would be considered a meat mitzvah. And so that even though the head and the body were separated, the coin would still be allowed to be mitami himself to um, to uh, make himself tame in order to bury his father. But what it seems is, is that under ordinary circumstances, if that happened and that coin son could find someone else to do it, maybe he should have someone else do it because then it would not be a case of a meat mitzvah. Okay, we didn't leave on a particularly nice note, okay? A uh, little bit of a gory case. But again, I think it's just beautiful to see, right, what we do from this, that this burying of the dead, this meat mitzvah, is something that we trace all the way back to the Gemara, right? We don't leave anybody alone. We don't leave any Jew behind, even in their period of death. It's our communal responsibility, right, to go ahead and to bury them, okay? So this this week's summary, uh, lots of more interesting things to come up in Nazir. I'm not sure if I'm going to be back. I may be back for the next, I'm doing about one a month. So I may be back for the next Masachat, because uh, we're going to finish this at the beginning of April. Um, and if anybody has any questions, thanks for your patience with going a little bit late with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Osmond. I think we're going to have to close down for because we're 10 minutes over, but thank you so I know, much. Sorry. Um, so much interesting material. And I believe we have a piece on the mate mitzvah coming out um, in another day or two. So I think that discussion must continue. Um, uh, really, really interesting and moving mitzvah. And of course, um, something that overrides the the corpse prohibition for for the nazir um we're gonna leave it there thank you everybody for coming thank you, thank you dosbrin for steering us around uh, a whole bunch of talmud real fast and real clearly and we will see you in your inbox tomorrow and in this space next week take care everybody bye-bye bye everyone